DNA series, there's joy, but there's sadness. Um, there's joy because we get to, we're kicking off something new, but there's sadness because I like the tables. I like the, the interaction. I like the, the, the mingling um, and everything. But, but if you were here with us for the last four weeks, what you would see is um, what you have heard from us is that we spent the last four weeks going over the DNA of our church, right? Which we said that we were gospel-centered believers, responsible siblings, indigenous disciple makers and generous stewards. We use the month of August every year as kind of a survey of who we are. This year, we're doing something a little differently because we use that as a survey, survey but for the next eight um, um, to 10, eight to 10 months, basically what we're gonna be doing is that we're gonna be taking a deep dive on each one of our aims. So we're kicking off today the um, we're kicking off today, gospel-centered believer. Um, if you have your Bibles, open up with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, and we're going to be looking at chapter 1, 1 through 12, and that's what we just read. Um, however, I got two basically introductions, because anytime you are introducing a new series, a new topic, basically you got to introduce the series, but then you kind of introduce the text of today. So if you're following with me, the first one is our introduction of the series um, that we are going to be doing. There is a, a passage in scripture, 1 Peter chapter 3, 15, that I think gives us a good understanding or gives us the pillars or the themes of where we're kind of be going um, throughout the book of First Peter. Um, in there, basically, we see kind of four themes, four things that we see. I'm going to read First Peter chapter 3.15. It's going to just, you got to look at it in your Bible because it won't be on the screen. First Peter 3.15, and then I want to break this down into four sections, and I want these themes to kind of, um, kind of resonate with us as we go throughout the um, this series for the next two months. We're going to be in Peter for the month of September and the month of October. October. 1 Peter 3.15 says this. It says, set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. Be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope that you possess, yet do it with gentleness and with reverence, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage against you, your conduct in Christ will be put to shame. In there, basically, I want to break this up into four sentences or four parts because I think these are the themes, these are the aims that we see throughout the book of Peter that I think is important for us to um, grasp as we are walking through. The first one is this idea where it says, set Christ apart as Lord in your heart. Right there, what it talks about, there's a sanctifying work that God is doing, and the first thing that we have to do is that we have to set Christ apart. So and we, we see this idea of understanding our identity in Christ. Um, we name this series, um, the, the idea of this series is just talking about built to last. We've been built differently, right? Talking about the foundation of who we are. And so Peter early on says that we were built on Christ alone. There's a verse in scripture, again, 1 Peter chapter 2, 6, um, it says this. It says, for it stands in scripture. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. And so we're talking about this first concept that Peter, and we're going to see throughout the theme of the book of First Peter, is that we got to first set Christ apart. We have to sanctify God in our hearts. The second thing is that we got to be ready. Be ready. This is going to kind of come to our fluency right? And so when we talk about a gospel-centered believer, the first thing that we talk about is that understanding our identity as individuals and collectively. But then secondly, it's talking about how are we becoming more fluent in the gospel. It says, be ready always to give an, an answer about the hope that we have, the hope that we have. You see, what we recognize is that Peter, Peter is often known as the apostle of hope. He looks at salvation, but he looks at salvation from a different lens that even um, Paul looks at our salvation or even a James, you know, that looks at a salvation. Peter looks at it from in more of a futuristic vantage point, and he talks about the hope that we have. So some people call Peter the apostle of hope, and he says that we are to be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within him. And that's a theme that we're going to see as well. The, the third one is this idea of personal humility, right? Um, the, the humility in which we are. We are to give a defense, an apologia, a defense of what we believe, but we are to do it 
with a sense of gentleness, with a sense of reverence um, to the Lord, understanding where we are and understanding where we come from. From. And so there's that we see that. And so we see those that we see first sanctify the Lord God in our heart. We see the theme of being ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within us. But we ought to do it with a sense of humility, with gentleness and reverence. And then lastly, he tells us to to do it with some personal piety. Right. Do it with a clear conscience. This is going to be important because God, um, Peter is going to call us to holiness. And as we are being called to holiness, it is important for us to understand that there is a sense of personal piety that is, that a clear conscience um, is important. So here's a theme. Here's the kind of the, the pillars. Those themes will help carry you to better understand the book of First Peter. How many of you guys have studied the book of First Peter before? Right? All right, so we have a few of us that have studied. So we're, as we're walking through verse by verse the book of 1 Peter, the reason why we walk through books of the Bible verse by verse is so that you don't, you're not surprised. When you come in here, you know. So listen, today we're going over 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 through 12. Guess what next week is going to be about? 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 25, right? So we're just going to go by sections of the Bible. So nobody can give any reason or any excuse of, I don't know what to study in my time with the Lord this week, because we're just walking through the verse, book of First Peter. So all you have to do is walk with us together, you know, as we are walking through First Peter. And this will help give us a game plan as we approach. But here's the thing about game plans. And here's what's unique about the book of First Peter. How many know the famous quote by Mike Tyson? Everybody has a game plan until you get punched in the mouth. Right. And here's the thing. You all we all come in with this game plan. We all know that we ought to first spend time with the Lord and do our thing with the Lord. We know that if people come, that we ought to be ready to give an answer of a defense and to be able to share our faith and share the gospel. We all know that we ought to walk with humility and all things. And we also know that there's a sense of holiness and piety that we are called to live and to live out. And all of us have that game plan. But here's the thing. We get punched in the mouth. And it seems like whenever we get punched in the mouth, all of our game plans goes out the window and we now start reverting to the, you know, nobody's perfect. God understands. And we start taking matters into our own hands. And you see, and this is the backdrop that we are going to see in the book of 1 Peter because these are things that, these are Christians, these are believers who understand that all of the things that was start, laid out in 1 Peter chapter 3.15 but they've been punched in the mouth. And the only thing that's going to get us through that is this hope, a hope that we have in Jesus, a hope that we have in the gospel. And this is where we're going to be picking up in 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 through 12. All right, so let's pray, and then we'll get into the meat of the text today. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to come before you. Thank you, Lord, that you've called us to first sanctify the Lord Jesus in our heart, being ready always to give a defense of the hope that lies within us. But we ought to do this with gentleness and with reverence, Father, understanding that we are to have a clear conscience before you and before others. And so, Father, we pray, God, for your will to be done. And as we embark upon this series, as we embark upon this text, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Amen and amen. I've entitled this series, The Hope. Not this series, I'm sorry. This message, The Hope in Our Salvation. The Hope in Our Salvation. And there's three things that I want us to do. And so if, you, if you're taking notes, basically verses three through five, I want you to put down a living hope. Verses 6 through 9, I want you to put down a joyful hope. And verses 10 through 12, I want you to put down a certain hope. Uh, the hope in our salvation is a living hope, a joyful hope, and a certain hope. All right, but before we jump into kind of this, let's kind of um, understand and unpack the introduction. Because Peter introduces the text basically like most people in his time would have introduced it, right? But he gives us this introductory, and there's something that gives us a little bit about the setting and the background of what's going on um, in the book of 1 Peter. It says this in verse 1, it says, Peter, who is 
an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he first starts off with himself, and he just says, Peter. Peter is one sent by God with authority. Ultimately, that word apostle means to be sent by God, but to be sent with authority. That if you were to look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, it gives us what, what's required to be considered an apostle. It's one who was with Jesus, one who looked at Jesus and walked with Jesus, and there's one who experienced the resurrection the resurrected are seen the resurrected Jesus and was sent out by Jesus. And so this, Paul says that it is Paul, Peter, sorry, Peter is an apostle, one sent by God with authority. And we're going to see why that's important. And he says now to the recipients, to those chosen, to those chosen, this is a book that's written to believers. This is a book that's written to people who have accepted the person and work of Jesus into their lives and is no longer living for themselves, but lives for the one who died for them, who has placed their confidence in him. And so we're talking to a group of people who have um, accepted Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, right? And so we see Peter begins with reminding them of their identity in Christ. And so when we talk about this idea of being a gospel-centered believer, we says the gospel reshapes our identity, where we live, where we think, and where we speak as people who have been made new. And so he gives us this example. He gives us this, um, this illustration. And the one illustration that we're going to see in this verse, in verse 1, is two times you see the word chosen chosen, right? And this word chosen basically brings out the, the, the nature of who we are and whose we are. And in here, what we see is um, three, that you see the, the Trinitarian, the Trinity come out in this book. Is that it says that we were chosen by the foreknowledge of God the Father. We were called out by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and then we were cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So in this very introduction, Peter, even though he's still in the introduction, he's saying that it is important for us to understand that you are chosen. And to be chosen means that you were chosen by God before, in the foreknowledge of God, you were set apart or sanctified by Jesus, right, or by the Holy Spirit, that that he was setting apart, um, he's calling us, sanctifying us for his purpose in that we were cleansed by the sprinkling of blood that we identify with Jesus. And so we, we see this, but here's the thing. It's just like, this is the part we celebrate. This is the part that we, we want. We all want to be chosen. We all want to have, have purpose and meaning in life. We all want to have a clean slate and know that we're forgiven for all the things that we've done wrong. But here's the, the reality. He says that chosen, you that are chosen, but then in the same breath, he says, living as exiles dispersed abroad. And you're just like, what's going on? This is kind of where the Scooby-Doo moment, you know, it's just like you look and you're just like, what's happening? Because on one end, we're talking about this idea of being chosen, but in the other breath, we are exiled in a row. And here's the thing. The people would say, well, Peter, it don't feel like we're chosen because I know that um, there was this thing, and when we first came to know the Lord, and, and it was all good. You remember the time 3,000 got saved, and all the people was taking place, all this thing. It was, what, it was like worship night every single night. We were gathering houses, and no one had need. All these things. Well, something happened. That is no longer taking place. Now we're living in exile. Now the, that, that experience is a different experience than what we had before. Because in there, it talks about this idea of living as exiles. He's talking to a group of persecuted believers all the way since the time of Acts chapter 7. When Stephen was martyred, the, we start, the Jews started to, the Christian Jews started to disperse. And this is where they get the word disperse is where the word is diaspora. And diaspora were the idea, of, it referred to Jews not living in Palestine, Right? So these were the Jews that weren't living in Palestine, and they were spread out. Because of persecution, 
they were out. They were not living. And if you remember in the Old Testament, the Old Testament was a reminder that God, that anytime the people were not living in the promised land, they were in Babylon or they were in any Assyria or wherever they were at, Persia, that this was a sign of judgment. It was a sign of judgment because they were supposed to be in Israel. They were supposed to be in the promised land. So anytime there, it was a sign of judgment. And so some of them, these believers, were saying there's something wrong because you promised one thing, that I'm chosen by God, but it feels like I'm not, but I'm living in exile. There is this tension that is going on. And Peter, who, by the way, is in exile, later on in 1 Peter chapter 5, 12 and 13, is going to tell us that Peter says he's writing from Babylon. You do know that there is no Babylon in that time. What Babylon represents is Babylon is the place of the Gentiles. It's the place of outside of God's authority. It's a place that biblically that they would always lie because we recognize ultimately in 1 Peter 5, 12 and 13, Peter is actually writing from Rome. But they were symbol, they were the representative because they were the one in authority or in power. They were the current place. They were the modern day Babylon. And so here's Peter who is writing as an exile to other exiles, to other people who says, I didn't know that this was the plan and we've all been hit in the face. But ultimately, how do we stick with it? How do we have hope? in the midst of plan. And I think this is, a, uh, this is an appropriate time for us to have this because guess what? Christians are not on the up and up right now. We're not the, the most pleasurable or the most loved, beloved people in our nation right now. And here's the thing, we're gonna be blamed for everything. And throughout this time, we're about to enter into a political season and there's gonna be people from the left and from the right and all these things. And they're gonna say that they're doing stuff in the name of God and guess what? The non-believers are not gonna be like parsing out, well, you're the good Christian. You're the bad Christian. Like, they're not doing that. They just say all of us are Christians. And there's going to be, and there is a time that we are in where there is persecution. Regardless of where you stand, regardless of where you did. You're like, and so you, we have to understand what does it look like for us to stand firm. And so this is Paul's request. He says after, or Peter's request, he says after understanding I'm an apostle sent by God, after recognizing that um, I, that that you, recognizing your situation, he ends this and would simply says, may the grace and peace be multiplied to you. He just says simply, this is, this is my prayer. This is my heart, is that grace and peace be multiplied to you. And so he, as, as an exile, is, that is the prayer, is that even though that we are exiled, that we will have peace. We would experience grace right? And so Peter takes it in verses 3 through 12 and basically talks about here's the hope of our salvation. The hope is a living hope, a joyful hope, and it's a certain hope. So he picks it up in verse 3, and he talks about this idea of a living hope. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, right? And so in here, he starts off with that word. He starts off with the term. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, many of us are familiar and understand what, what it means to have blessings, God's blessing on us, right? We, we understand that, right? When we have God's favor on us, when God sees us, he knows us, right? We see that um, throughout that this idea of blessed is the man, like, whole, like, like happy, blessed, we sense this sense of contentment. But the Psalms over and over again are filled with this idea of blessing upon God. What does it mean to have blessings upon God? Well, if you have the King James Version, some of the KJV would say that they, um, you know, change the word from a blessing and they use the word praise. Right? And so they talk about praise the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that in some other translations. You see, but the word, the Hebrew word um, for bless simply means to kneel. To kneel. That's what it means. It's so when we bless, ultimately what we're saying is, Lord, we are kneeling before you. 
And in our kneeling, what we are saying is, God, you are greater. You are holy. That in that, that I must decrease and so that you must increase. And it's like we are giving God what he's worth, who he's, um, and what he is worth, and we are blessing him. It means to praise him. It means to exalt him. Ultimately, it means to worship him. And so in here, we humble ourselves and we worship God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what he says? He gives us the reason. He says, because why are we doing that? Why are we worshiping? Why are we kneeling? Why are we prostrating ourselves before God? Because of his great mercy. You see, there's a difference between mercy and grace. Grace is both, it's unmerited favor, it's also divine enablement, like with something, um, it's something that we don't deserve, something that we don't merit. You see, but mercy is different. Mercy is us not getting what we're supposed to get. How many of us has done some dirty things and we never got caught for doing it? Well, guess what? God saw it. You were actually caught because God saw it. How many of us are grateful that God is not punishing us for all the things that we do? How many of us would be embarrassed if we just started throwing a screen on all the thoughts that we have in our hearts and our mind and it was all, right? How many of us would have that? And see, here's the thing. Like, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy. The problem with many of us, we have forgotten how merciful God has been to us, and so we don't dispense mercy to others. And so we don't understand the reality of sitting prostrate before God because we forgot of how bad we really are. You see, the Bible tells us that we are all like sheep going astray. We all go into our own way. But he says, no, don't forget it's his mercy. It's his mercy. So he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only does he give us mercy, he doesn't just leave us there. He says, listen, I'm also going to gift you something. He says, I'm, he has given us. And I'm just like, man, like, God, you, like, I just would have been good with you just forgiving me and being merciful to me. But no, he doesn't stop there. He says he has gifted us. What has he gifted us? He's gifted us a new birth. He's gifted us a living hope. He's gifted us an inheritance, right? He gifted us. And so when he talks about this living hope, that we have a joy that is living, when he says that living hope, that that living hope has a twofold meaning, that one, it's a living hope, why is it a living hope? It's simply because we serve a God that has been resurrected. That even though that he, was die, he died on the cross, but in three days he was raised, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father advocating for us. That it's not one thing that he did back in the past, but it's constantly. So every time we do dirt, every time we do wrong, he's like God. He's like Jesus is advocating for us. It's like, I died for that. I, I died for that. I died for that. And he keeps reminding, he keeps letting us know that he's died for that because it's an ongoing mercy. It's a living hope. You see, and when we recognize that it's both a living hope, but it's also a lively hope. You see, when we know that we have been forgiven and we have mercy both in the past, the present, and in the future, there's something in us that stops striving for something else. Because we recognize that we can only, we, just like Paul said in 2 Corinthians, that we are now compelled by God's love. It's, that's the motivator. That's the thing that gets us up in the morning. That's the thing that excites us. It's because of his great love that we get up and that his mercy both is a living mercy, a living hope, but it's also a lively one. You see, because there's this confident expectation that we have in that, in our salvation. It's a gift of God's mercy that activates the believer's soul. It activates it. And you know, and so when he talks about that, we have this living hope, but then he talks about, but also we have this imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance. Do you see the, the language that is used here? You see, he gives us these terms, these, they, he says imperishable, undefiled, unfading. These are all used to describe a heavenly inheritance that is indestructible, right? It's not subject to death. 
It's not subject to sin. It's not subject to even what time can do or anything that time could do, the effects of time. You see, when he talks about being imperishable, it's something that is permanent. It's not corruptible. Right? When he talks about something that is undefiled, it's something that is unstained by sin, evil, or decay. Right? When he talks about something that is unfading, it's something that will never lose its beauty or glory or wither or grow dim. You see, if, you know, you guys remember the, like the game Telephone, right? And if I were to whisper something into Angie's ear and then Angie was the whisper and her end and, and we kind of went around, by the time it got around to Darren, don't trust anything that has been said to you, right? Because we recognize that in that process, we've lost whatever was said in the beginning. He says, no, but that's not the hope that we are talking about. It is one that is undefiled, that is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that we put our confidence in a God that has been resurrected, that is living in there. You see, and it's in that when we understand that we have a living hope, then we shift our mentality from a uh, uh, hopelessness or from, you know, from being hopeless to understand that we may be powerless. And there's a difference. You understand the difference between powerless and hopeless? Right? On one end, we may be powerless. None of us has control over what today is going to bring. We don't have power. We don't have control. We think that we do, and some are living in the illusion that we have control, but we don't have control over what's going to happen. And you're understanding that we are powerless. The Bible says that blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who recognize that we are poor and we don't have much to bring in terms of controlling, right? Blessed are those who are poor. But there's a difference between being poor in spirit and being hopeless. And he says this, we, this living hope is a hope that, is, that, is, that we recognize that even though we're powerless, we can go to the one who is powerful. Um, I, I travel a lot, and I have this love-hate relationship with traveling. Like, uh, I love traveling, but I also, like, don't like getting on planes. Why? Because I don't control the air. Like, I can't control. I, like, and so um, I have this issue. And so every single time I get on planes, the first thing that I say, God, I'm afraid. I touch the plane on the outside of the plane. I touch the outside of the plane, and I says, God, I'm not in control, and I'm afraid, but you are. And so what I recognize is that I recognize that I am not powerless over whether that plane stays up or not. There's nothing I can do besides stay still, and that's doing nothing. Right? There's nothing I can do. I'm powerless over whether the plane goes up. But I'm not hopeless because there is one who is powerful that is able to keep the plane and all that. And so we recognize that even though I'm powerless, I'm not hopeless that he's saying that we have a living hope. And when we recognize this living hope, that we recognize that we not only have a living hope, but we have a joyful hope. And so in here in verse 6, he says, Rejoice! You rejoice in this. Even though now for a short time it is necessary, you suffer grief and various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which is through perishable, is refined by fire, may result in the praise, the glory, and the honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So in here, you know, and I don't know about you, but as soon as I've read that verse, you know what I, I was reminded of, what we just read in the book of James. In James chapter 1, um, 3 through 5, where it says, count it joy when you fall into various trials. Ultimately, Peter is saying the same thing that James is saying. If you remember in James chapter 1, 2 through 5, it says this, consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you experience various trials, because you know the testing of your faith produces endurance, but let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives all to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. So in here, basically, we talk about like this idea of a living hope, and we understand that a living hope is both living because of the resurrection, and it's lively. It helps us through expectation. Um, here, we talk about a joyful hope. And when we talk about a joyful hope, there's a few things that we got to understand. One, that if you look at those passages, both um, James chapter 1 and 1 Peter chapter 1, you'll see a few themes in both of them of how do we live life when we keep getting punched in the face, 
How do we keep having hope even in the midst of our trauma, even in the midst of our tragedies, even in the midst of living as exiles in a foreign land? And in both passages, there's first, there's this command to, one, rejoice. James tells us to count it all joy. Peter tells us to rejoice. He says it's imperative, you know, that we rejoice. And there's a difference between worldly joy and the joy of the Lord. Worldly joy is based upon it's what we call happiness. It's based upon the circumstances that we have, where the joy of the Lord is something that comes from the fruit of the Spirit, an abiding relationship with him. But he also tells us not only to rejoice, both passages also tell us to remain. James tells us to let the endurance have its full effect so that you can be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. First Peter says, remain in the presence, even though you're suffering for a short time. You see, basically what he is saying is that our prayers need to shift. Instead of us praying for deliverance, we got to pray for wisdom. God is trying to do something in the midst of our trials. And he says, and here's the thing, here's the point, and this is the illustration that he uses in this, in, in 1 Peter. He says, suffering can purify the character of our faith. Suffering can purify the character of our faith. You see, trials do to faith what fire does to gold. Right? And so he uses this example of a refiner who goes in, and you've heard the illustration of the man who had bars of gold, and he puts them into the fire, and the apprentice, the young apprentice, was like, well, how do we know when it's done? And the old head basically said is when we're able to receive the reflection in it. You see, it's something about the, the fire that burns away all the impurities that's in the gold until all you have is the gold, the liquid gold, and then you're able to see it in his face. And he says, so you see our face, and he says in the same way, our suffering, if we remain, if we hold on to our faith, has a way of um, imp purifying the character of our faith. It reveals its true value, its true genuineness of what's really going on. You see, it tells us, so it says that we ought to rejoice. Both pastors tell us we ought to remain, but then both pastors tell us to reach out. Reach out. James says this, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously. Peter says, keep reaching out through faith. Verses 8, 8 and 9 says this, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you are not seeing him now, you believe in him. You rejoice with inexpressible, glorious joy because you're receiving the goal of your faith, Right? In here, basically what he is saying is that we, whenever you come, whenever you are born again, you have to return back to your childlike faith. All of us were born with hope. You guys understand that, right? We were all born with hope, right? Because when you were young, when you were babies, you know what you did? You cried out whenever, even though you were powerless, you weren't hopeless. Because what a baby did with their powerlessness is that they cried out. They reached out to someone who has power to come and help them to meet their need. You see, but something has happened, and I don't know if that happened at three years old, four years old, five years, eight, 12. Something happened to all of us when we cried out for someone or something and they didn't show up. And it was at that point we stopped being human. We start having to live in the brokenness of the reality. We start trying to cover ourselves up with fig leaves and things to try to make something happen because we recognize. And at that point, we, if we embrace not just our powerlessness, we, oh, we begin to start letting hopelessness come in. And he's basically saying, no, no, no. God is the Father through Jesus is not like that. He is a God that will continually come and continually be. But we have to keep reaching. We have to keep reaching out to him. You see, all throughout scripture, we see persecution of the church. We see trials, we see hardships that believers will face and that we will face. Our, there's no king's ex. We will face the same. But here's the challenging thing. 
when we go, we got to understand and we have to see this, that God is doing something. He is up to something with us and he's trying to um, show the quality of our faith, but we have to keep reaching out to him, right? And we have to make war with our thing, with what's going on. And so that final, final one under that is that we have to refocus. We are all like sheep have gone astray, but it's our, in our refocusing that we have to remember that. And so for some of us, like for me, the way I refocus, I, I like to sing praise songs. I'll just turn the radio up and I'll just listen and something that's singing the glory of God and I just kind of remind. Or I like to just tell the truth through confession. Like when sin entered into the world and God says, where are you, Adam? And he says, I'm lonely, I'm sad, I'm hurt. That we can just tell the truth. With it. And sometimes it may be through just fellowship. You know, a, a couple of weeks back, I said that everybody needs to be, everybody has to have a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. And if you think about that, what we're saying is that every, the Pauls are your mentors. And who is your mentor? Timothys are the people you're mentoring. Who are you mentoring? Who are you pouring? Who are you making disciples? But then in the middle is that Barnabas. And you know what the word Barnabas, his name means? Encourager. Who are those people who are going to give you courage when you lack courage, when you're fatigued? Who are those people who are going to lift you up when you are down? And as we close, I just want to end with this. Not only do we have a hope that is living hope, not only do we have a joyful hope that we ought to count it joy, but we have a certain hope. 10 through 12 basically talks about the prophets. It talks about the apostles, right? And what I love about the text, it talks about how they searched carefully, investigated carefully the grace of God of our salvation. That he says all the way from the beginning and what we see in um, Genesis chapter 3, the proto-evangelion, the first gospel. That as soon as sinner enter into the world, he says, he talks about Jesus coming in and he will crush your, the head of the serpent and you will bruise his heel. That was the first gospel talking about Jesus will come and though, even though he would bruise his heel, his death, he would be raised, his resurrection. But he will overcome, he will conquer sin. And it says all throughout the scriptures that all of these scriptures are testifying and declaring of the one to come. Jesus, the Messiah. And then the apostles come in and they are the one verifying what God has been proclaiming for thousands and thousands of years has become true. And yes, it is Jesus. And this is what 1 John says. He says, what we have seen with our eyes and we've held with our hands and we walk with him, we talked with him. He says, what we have seen, we now proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father, right? And so he says that there is this certain hope that we have. There's this credibleness that we have. You see, the hope that they're talking about is one that has been investigated, one that has been underlaid. See, here's the thing. The way that you can dispel Christianity is to go simply finding the bones of Jesus because all of our confidence in the fact that he's living and that from the beginning, They've proclaimed that. And from the um, after, we said he is risen. And we recognize this. And so there's a hope that is laid up for us that is in heaven. And so when we talk about hope, we're not talking about this hope that is kind of 50-50. You know, there's like 50% chance it's going to rain today and 50% chance it's not going to rain. That's not the type of hope that he's talking about. But the type of hope that he's talking about is one that is laid up for us in heaven. Now I'll end with this. You know, in back in the days, you know, I used to always think with my siblings and my brothers and cousins, grew up with cousins and all that. We used to, I used to play this game all the time, like, hey, let's see if I can get anybody, all my siblings in trouble so that they would not get the Christmas present, right, on Christmas Day, right? And so it, here's the thing, because here's the thought was, if, that if I get them in trouble, then their Christmas will be delayed. And as I'm opening gifts, They'll be, right? And so there was this thing. It was bad, diabolical. But it's, but I'm just, like, it's confession. It's a safe space. Safe space, right? And so, so I was doing this. But here's the, here's the reality. 
it wasn't a 50-50 chance. No matter how much trouble I got them into, it wasn't a 50-50 chance of whether they're going to get it or not. You know why? Because it was already purchased. The gift was already laid up in, under the tree, and all they have to see is the wrapping. So it wasn't about whether or not. It was just about walking in to it. And so in the same way, when we talk about our hope, we're not talking about a 50-50 chance that maybe he's right and maybe I'm wrong. He said that our hope is laid up in the resurrection of Jesus, that our hope has already been paid for, that we put all of our confidence, not in the philosophy of Paul or our interpretation of the philosophy of even Jesus and Peter. We put all of our confidence in the resurrection, that we have a hope that has already been paid for. It has already been purchased. It's already been bought. And we know that it, because the present has already wrapped and it's under the tree. And no matter what, no matter if we have diabolical people or people who come who try to get us into trouble or get us off the course, we are only walking into the hope. Some of us saw the Olympics. And I remember seeing the Olympics and I think it was like the second to last game or the third or the championship game, the USA team Right, you can do with the Simone Bowles and, um, you know, with the team. And I just remember, like, I was going, it was like, I won. They won the gold medal. They won the gold medal. And I was like, yeah, they won the gold medal. So, like, just like because of the time things, I went in. I was just like, I've already seen it. I knew that they won the gold medal. But um, I remember we're looking at the first event, and it was just like, they didn't do too well. And the first, I think it was like the balance beam, and they didn't, like, perform. And I was just like, I don't see how they're going to win this gold medal. But you know what? I already knew that the script was already written. I already knew that they already won because already the news was already announced that they won the gold medal. And I'm just having to stay faithful and walk in the reality and watch them walk through to coming out on the other end and winning the gold medal. You see, saints, it's the same for us. The script has already been written and our hope that we have, no matter where you are in life, we just got to remain we just got to trust in the living hope of a Savior that knows that on the other side, we win. We win. And so when the Bible says, but first sanctify the Lord God in our heart, being ready always to give a reason of the hope that we have. But do this with reverence. Do this with gentleness. Do it with a clear conscience, understanding that God is a merciful God. And in the same way he hasn't given you, he hasn't given me what we deserve, he has a group of people, a bunch of people, your friends, your neighbors, your fellow students, that he wants that same mercy to be given. So instead of us judging them, let's just introduce them to a loving God, into a hope in the midst of a hopeless world that we are maybe powerless, but we are not hopeless. And so what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate this through communion. Can you?